found it and ordered all the Jews to leave it. I was sent pictures and I was reading things and looking at photographs provided by the unsaved Jewish journalist. Please pray for her. She knows a lot of Christians. Melanie Phillips. And radically Muslims dressing their children in radical Hamas garb and the British police holding them in publicity photos with the British police. You've got a Scottish First Minister who's a Muslim. I never saw somebody who wears a kilt and a kafir at the same time. And he's saying that Scotland and Britain should take Muslim refugees from Gaza and port more of these Hamas people into Britain. Uh, every day of the week, black African Christians in northern Nigeria are being slaughtered by Boko Haram. Why doesn't anybody want to take the persecuted Christians from northern Nigeria's refugees. As we speak, every day of the week, Christians in Nagoro Karabakh are being murdered by Muslims. Why don't you see the First Minister of Scotland wanting to take in the Christians who are being persecuted by Muslims? No, it's only if somebody stands up to them. It's a great crime, you see. Then you've got a mayor of London who's a Muslim and who's made some disgusting statements that should be an offense to any British person in their right mind, and politically pressuring the police. Then you get, and I'm not trying to politically editorialize, but it shows the, the state of the country and what's happening spiritually, not just politically and, and sociologically. A young woman, an Asian woman no less, but a patriot, a British patriot, her family are from Goa, Goa were Portuguese-speaking Indians. They were Roman Catholic mainly. But that was her family. She's not from a Hindu background. She is from a, a, a nominally Christian background, Suella Braverman. And she's the Home Secretary. It's within her brief to maintain oversight of the police. And the Hindu... Prime Minister, who celebrated Diwali in number 10 Downing Street, worshiping what the Bible calls demon idols, fired her. The Muslims are the victims. They hijacked, hijacked Armstrong's Day. They came to this country and hijacked a day to commemorate the British war dead, beating up veterans. And the hands of the police being tied, at best subdued by politicians. Of course, in the United States, it was not much better, except in the United States there's a lot more support for Israel. But when this thing began, the Biden administration, Camilla Harris comes out and says, we're going to have to, a national strategy against Islamophobia. They kill 1,400 Jews, they behead Jewish babies, behead infants. And Biden and Harris want to have a national strategy against Islamophobia. You couldn't make this up, could you? It's utterly depraved. It's happening in Britain, it's happening in America, it's happening in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, certainly continental Europe. It's happening everywhere. And it's the ones who stand up and tell the truth that are the bad guys. They're the threat. We've got to stop Islamophobia. If this isn't God's judgment, I don't know what is.
what the Babylonians were doing before the captivity. And you still saw Jews in bed with the Babylonians. There are left-wing Jews now in bed with the anti-Israel protesters, including ultra-Orthodox Jews who are anti-Zionists. Not a lot, but they certainly exist and they're very vocal. This is just what you saw before the Babylonian captivity. It's so sick. It's unbelievable. We're not here to talk about those things, but it is not possible to address what we are here to talk about without taking notice of these things. For many years, we've been talking about the man of lawlessness. And we've been warning for many years, I mean more than a quarter of a century, that the rapture will not happen until the faithful church knows who the Antichrist is. 25, 30 years ago, people were talking about this, not just us, we were only one of many. But it's no longer a mere academic exercise or a point of curiosity about biblical prophecy. We are getting closer and closer. We find ourselves in a situation where among believers, you have those who say, don't worry about the Antichrist. They are caught up in the 19th century delusion of John Darby called pre-tribulationism that the early church never believed, that the word of God does not teach. Don't let them tell you different. And as that misinterpretation of scripture implodes, the Holy Spirit is showing more and more Christians it's not true. They become almost ludicrous in their reaction. You've got people, well he's definitely got other problems, this J.D. Farrag in America saying that Christians who don't believe in a pre-trib, that they're of the devil. You've got people who used to be considered credible expository exegetes, saying that the apostasy is the rapture, based on a ludicrous, ludicrous exegesis of the Greek text of 2 Thessalonians. The word FSDMI does not even occur in the text, but that becomes their argument. We've talked about this elsewhere, not our subject now. But then among those who are realizing or have realized that there will be an advent of Antichrist before the return of Christ, among those who understand the reality of a coming Antichrist, and false prophet, there has emerged three different categories of opinion, three different persuasions, three different camps, and at times they've been even inimical in their disposition towards one another. There are those who've argued for the traditional view held by most dispensational Christians who are not pre-trib and not all dispensationalists are pre-trib and never have been. Among the early brethren, there were people who went against Darby and didn't believe it, including Dr. Samuel Tregalis, the Greek scholar. Not all the brethren even believed it. It was Darby's force of personality and his, his despotic modus operandi that forced this thing. But there are three different schools of opinion. The traditional, more dispensational ones said, and still say, 
He's going to come from a reconfederated Roman Empire of some description, of which the EU is the predecessor or embryo. We've all heard that. I suppose to varying degrees, we've all believed it. Okay. But then there are those who say the Antichrist will have to be a Jew, at least one of those two beasts. Then there are those who are now saying, in light of the rise of radical Islam, that the Antichrist will be a Muslim. You've got these three separate camps. Unlike the people who speak the pre-trib nonsense that really do not have a credible exegetical basis for what they're saying, These people who do believe we must know who the Antichrist is before the return of the Lord, before the parousia, they all seem to be able to make at least credible arguments. They're not on face value speaking rubbish. You know, when somebody tells you arbitrarily that the Greek word for tribulation, thalipsis, and the Greek word for wrath, orge, are synonyms. They're just speaking rubbish. We're not appointed unto wrath, orge. We won't be here for the wrath of God, but the wrath of the devil. Christians have always been here for the wrath of the devil, and when Antichrist is manifested, there will be the mega thalipson, a great tribulation. These people have no linguistic or credible exegetical argument for what they're saying. And when you challenge them, it always comes down to their believing Darby. We once had a lady who was 34 years in the closed brethren, the Taylorites in this country. Because the Darbyists sprinkled her as a baby, she thought she was born again. She wasn't even saved. If you've seen the closed brethren, the exclusive brethren, they're a cult, aren't they? They're a cult. And they emerged at a time in the 19th century after the Millerite, the great disappointment, when many cults emerged. The Mormons emerged in the 19th century, but the Seventh-day Adventists, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and the closed brethren all came from that great disappointment and its aftermath. Darby was a hyper-dispensationalist, as you know. I don't want to go into this because most of you know it. But I ask a pre-trib person, I'll ask any one of them, I'll ask even ones who are friends of mine, Arnold Fruchtenbaum. I like Arnold. Well, we have. But he's bought into this stuff now. Don't ask me why. He's retiring soon. Uh, Thomas Ice. Uh, even people I really like, like, like Dr. Mark Hitchcock, people who I otherwise like. And my question to them is simple. Do you believe the Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians, it's for unsaved Jews? Of course not. Do you believe the epistle of James is not part of the New Testament? It's for unsaved Jews. Of course not. Then why do you believe Matthew 24 and the Olivet Discourse is not part of the revelation to the church, that it's not for Christians, it's for unsaved Jews? They change their hermeneutic. There's no consistency. They buy right into Darby's Bill of Goods. If you ask them that they believe in handling scripture that way or any other prophecy that way, if you believe that about the Sermon on the Mount, oh no, do you believe that about James' epistle? No, no, no. But you believe it about Matthew 24? Oh yes. There's no consistency. You 
Move the goalpost. <laughs> you change the rules. You change. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> You've got to be consistent to be credible. I believe that the fact that there's people who will still buy into this stuff, knowing where it came from and who it came from. That Darby was a cult leader. When you point out to them, look, this is where you got this stuff. Charles Spurgeon warned against him publicly, said he was enough. George Mueller, you know who George Mueller was, right? He, watch out for this guy. Dr. Samuel Tregalis, watch out for this guy. His contemporaries knew he was a nut job. Yet they're following him. He's a cult leader. All cult leaders are crazy. They believe their own publicity. They become self-infatuated. They begin to think as if they're infallible. And if you disagree with them, you're going against God. The Roman papacy is based on that same mentality, isn't it? But what happens when believers subscribe to it and they're doing it? Even people you'd think would know better. I can go on and on, and I have done, and you know that, and there's no need to say another word about it, but for the sake of the recording, I had to. For newer people. But the people who are saying Islamic Antichrist, Jewish Antichrist, European Antichrist, these people are at least bringing cogent argumentation. In other words, they're saying reasonable things. There can be elements you disagree with, but you can't throw them out the window as being crazy. They at least have a case a well-thought-out case, and something that they've obviously prayed about and thought about. They're not just speaking rubbish. But you've got these three different points of view. We are getting closer to the advent of Antichrist and false prophet. We don't speculate about dates, but we see the writing on the wall. All these things, and you know what it is, everything from the... AI certainly is a big one. Subcutaneous implantation of, 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 of microchips to purchase things in Sweden, they're already doing it. There's, there's so much, You've, you know all these things. It's getting closer. And Satan knows his time is short. Remember, three kinds of people the Gentile nations, he has them deceived. Unbelieving Israel, the Jews, he has them deceived. That leaves the true church constituted of both believing Jews and believing non-Jews. That's who he is trying to deceive, us, the elect. He's got a lot of Christians bamboozled about a lot of things. But the ones who are like the sons of Issachar, they recognize the times. Or the ones like the Maccabees and Daniel, those who know their God will understand what's going on when nobody else does and take action and give understanding to the many. Those are the only people in the church who are really a major threat to his agenda insofar as setting the stage for Antichrist and false prophets. But now, that contingent, and it's a growing contingent, more and more believers all over the world are beginning to realize pre-trib is rubbish. More and more are abandoning it. The Holy Spirit is showing them. You can take it out on people who don't believe it. You can get angry about it. The way Amir Safardi, a tour guide, thinks he's a Bible expositor. 
he actually said, Michael, the archangel is Jesus. And then when he was forced to retract it, he got angry and made himself the victim. Now, I know him from Israel. He's not a pastor or a leader in Israel. He's a tour guide and he's a reserve military officer. When he stuck to political commentaries about the Middle East, he was fine. In fact, he was, did a good job of it most of the time. But when he makes himself some kind of a theologian, he speaks rubbish. And he's really angry at the people who don't believe what he's saying. Who would take their cues from somebody who says the Sermon on the Mount and the Epistle of James is not for Christians? Who would take their cues from somebody who believed and taught before he got a backlash and had to climb down and then blamed other people for accosting him over it? That Jesus is Michael the Archangel, a Seventh-day Adventist doctrine, and, and then he began protesting. I'm, then he, he quotes from a Jehovah's Witness website. <laughs> and then when he's accosted for that, he says, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. I believe in the deity of Jesus. Nobody said you didn't, but he's not Michael the Archangel. But because he's Israeli, as if that's a credential in itself, or because he's a tour guide, that gives him credibility and platform. <laughs> I know Israeli believers who know the scriptures a lot better than he does. Much better. Now, I'm not against the guy personally, but he speaks a lot of rubbish. You can't lend credibility to somebody who says something like that, that Jamaica, the archangel, is Jesus Christ. You can't put somebody like that on a pedestal. But they do, and they listen to them. This is dangerous. This is dangerous. But that's what's happening. And they get so angry at the people who don't subscribe to the pre-trip and who believe we have to know who the Antichrist is, which is what the Word of God teaches and what the early church believed. They get so angry. But that contingent, that, I wouldn't want to use the term remnant, but certainly that contingent of believers are divided against themselves into three primary camps. European, Jewish, Arab. I addressed this in part in a book I wrote called No Bomb in Gilead. And we've approached the subject in a book I wrote called Shadows of the Beast. And it will be pivotal in the next book I'm planning to write, Lord Willing, Born in a Manger, Coming on a Cloud tentatively entitled, but don't hold your breath. It's going to take a while. Things are happening so quick, yeah. prof prophetic significance, but by the time you write a book like that, it's outdated. <laughs> You'd have to keep revising it before you could publish it, and then the next day it would... <laughs> quite a challenge. Anyway, we've got these three camps. I would venture to say among ourselves, there are people who could be persuaded in one of these three directions. Some of you might think European. Some of you might think Antichrist is going to be a Jew, European, or a Muslim. Even among ourselves, we may very well, just in this conference, have people who are representative of each of those views. And it's becoming sometimes even confrontational. I've watched some of the debates online between the proponents of the different views, and, and they can become quite angry with each other. Quite, it's, it's not a friendly discussion type debate. They, have, they can become almost contentious. 
and they all have certain amount of apparent credibility doctrinally and theologically to what they're saying. This is going to be an urgent matter for the body of Christ. How do we reconcile these three points of view? For many years, we've been warning, work while you have the light, night will come when no man can work. Antichrist will be manifested. That will be followed eventually by a horrible persecution before the rapture, and then his determination to exterminate the Jews. It's going to happen. Work while you have the light. Night will come. No man can work. I don't know how much time we have, but I know that we have less time than we did yesterday. And yesterday we had less time than we did the day before that, and tomorrow there's going to be less time than there is now, today. This is not just something we do because it's an interesting or entertaining subject. In many respects, it's obvious, obviously a difficult and painful subject. But it's a necessary one. Look how fast things are changing. Would you have imagined Muslim hordes hijacking Remembrance Day 10 years ago? Beating up World War II veterans for selling poppies? And then anyone in government who stands against it gets fired. Now, this didn't happen in a vacuum. You had Islamic criminal gangs pimping off English girls in Rotherham. Pimps. The police knew it. The Crown Prosecutor knew it. The Labor Council knew it. But you can't offend the Islamic community. So it's just allowed to continue. There's always been two kinds of English people. Again, not to be political. You had the Churchill, Thatcher kind of English people. And you had the Labour Party. You had the Chamberlains. Okay. You appease. You appease. You appease. Until you're boxed in a corner and now you can't punch your way out, so you have to get somebody who can. If the Labour Party had not brought this country to ruination, and I'm not trying to be political, Churchill never would have been the Prime Minister. If the winter of discontent, and most of you are old enough to remember that, certainly. If the Labour Party had not brought this country to economic ruination, Maggie Thatcher never would have got elected. They turn to somebody who's a patriot when it's too late. That's somehow the British psyche. Now, other countries are guilty of it too, but Britain makes the mold. <laughs> Just as there was an American general named Billy, Billy Mitchell, they fired him because he predicted Pearl Harbor 18 years before it happened. So they fired him for being right. <laughs> they court-martialed him. Had he not been a hero in the First World War, he would have been dishonorably discharged. They gave him a way out. Uh, that's what they did to him. Churchill messed up in Gallipoli, no question. But... He warned Hitler needed to be stopped at Munich. Didn't want to listen to him. What did you have? Coventry being flattened? The east end of London being flattened? Liverpool being gutted? The Blitz. Didn't have to happen! But it did. I always tell people who'd like to forget 
I remember the Labor Party and the Committee for Nuclear Disarmament were synonymous in this country. There was some, Neil Kinnock and all these guys, synonymous. The Soviets, as they were then, aimed SS-20 missiles at Birmingham, London, Edinburgh, Newcastle, Nottingham, Glasgow, Manchester, Bristol. When Thatcher wanted to react, and Carter was a weak American president, but even he knew we have to deploy cruise missiles. You had thousands and thousands of lesbians at Greenham Common protesting the Americans and Thatcher for wanting to point cruise missiles. They wanted peace. We can't respond to this threat. Well, fortunately, Maggie had her way. She made her mistakes, but she didn't prevail. The Americans pressured the British government, of course, but Maggie knew that it had to be done. Well, the dreaded arms race was reignited. Guess who won? If the Labor Party had its way in this country, don't forget, if the Labor Party had its way in this country, there'd be 420 million people in Eastern Europe still living on back of the Iron Curtain. There'd be no united Germany, Poland, the Baltic, uh, the Baltic states, Hungary, Romania, Czechoslovakia, take your pick. They would all be under the thumb of the Kremlin if the Labor Party had had its way in Britain. Fortunately, they didn't. The Iron Curtain came down. Now, when you tell this to people on the political left, they don't even know about it anymore. The young ones don't even know about it. And the older ones want to forget about it. On back of these political scenarios, there are spiritual forces at work. This is clear from the book of Daniel, very clear. It's not just politics or diplomacy. It is a spiritual conflict. Satan's trying to destroy Christianity. And he's trying to destroy Israel and the Jews. And he uses political means to do it. But his ultimate weapon is still to come, the man of lawlessness and the false prophet. Look at the politics, but understand from the book of Daniel particularly and the book of Zechariah, what is on back of it. Now, I'm not campaigning for any political party. I'm just stating historical facts. These things happened, and no matter what political persuasion is, nobody can deny they have been the realities. Nobody. Sir William Beveridge, the welfare state, the welfare state was begun after the Second World War when you had all of these war widows with kids whose husbands the kids' fathers were killed in the war against the Nazis and against the Imperial Japanese. That was what a single parent family was, a war widow whose husband was killed fighting for Britain. Now, a single parent family is a woman in a council flat, as I've said before, with five kids from three different yobos and you're paying for them. That is never what it was intended to be. You understand? <laughs> the spiritual and moral breakdown of the society results in the quagmire you've inherited. 
Now, we happen to be in Britain. I could sing a similar song in the States. Perhaps not to the same degree, but it's the same thing. The left has destroyed one city in America after another. They've made cities uninhabitable. But let's look. Daniel speaks of political events, doesn't he? And he speaks of the spiritual forces on back of these events. And we understand that. The Second World War, without Hitler and Stalin, Israel never would have been reestablished as a nation. God used Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin more than he used Ben-Gurion or Theodor Herzl. Herzl and, and, and Ben-Gurion, they, they, they couldn't have... This is God's hand in history. It's God's hand in history. God's hand in history. But here we go. Here we are. The unbelievable speed and momentum at which these changes are happening in the Western world, in the States, in continental Europe, and here in Britain. The speed at which these things have happened. Now, we're just speaking of one aspect. The idea of taxpayer-funded schools having transvestites indoctrinating children as young as four in some cases, certainly five and six and seven, into a sexual orientation that 25 years ago would have been considered unnatural. Look how fast it's changed. What Isaiah said, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. It's not just happening in the political realm. It's not just happening in the Middle East. And it's not just happening on one issue. It's across the board. We have to realize, as the sons of Issachar did, the times in which we live. Most people don't and will not until it's too late. The people who voted labor found out too late that Eden was a bad prime minister and Hitler was not a man you could be friends with. Oh, they found out, but it was too late. These people are gonna find out, you understand. They're gonna find out. The full, the, <laughs> they'll find out. But we're not here to talk about society. We're here to talk about the body of Christ. The foolish virgins will find out. They're going to know. They're going to know those they rejected were right and that they were wrong. They will know. But it will be too late. But for those who, like the sons of Issachar, know the times, and who love the appearance of his coming, Mar-Anata, it's not too late. Now's the time. As we've said many times, give me oil in my lamp, keep it burning, like the old-time Pentecostals used to sing. Okay. But now we still have this new problem. Okay, the Antichrist is coming before the Lord does, and we have to know who he is. But there's no consensus. There's no uniform opinion except that he's coming. Is he going to be a Jew or a non-Jew? Is he going to be European or not? Or a Muslim? How do we put this together? Some of you know I've addressed these things in my books. How be it not 
conclusively, but we certainly address them. But now we're addressing them for the greater Christian public on the internet. More and more people watch this stuff. So let's look at it. Let's begin with the Islamic version of eschatology. They don't call it that. But for want of a better description, that's what it is. They have a doctrine about the return of Christ. The question, of course, is which Christ? Islam teaches that Allah, not to be confused with Yahweh, Allah, the Nabataean moon god, will send Jesus Christ back. Jesus Christ will return to earth. And he'll get married, have children, and die. <laughs> and be honored with burial in a grave next to Mohammed's. <laughs> Says Islam. They call him Isa. Arab believers call him Yeshua HaMasiyah. Islam calls him Isa. Isa is not the son of God. Now we're told directly in 1 John that which denies the father's son relationship is antichrist, isn't it? So it's an antichrist religion. He did not die on the cross. Judas died on the cross. He didn't die. He was somehow raptured. Not in the sense of the ascension of Jesus, but in the sense that Elijah was. Jesus never died. He's like Elijah or Enoch. And Allah is going to send them back with a mission. The first phase of his mission will be to deconvert Christianity from Christianity and tell them they've got it all wrong. And what they believed about him is completely false. Allah is going to send him back. Now when he comes back, he's going to have multiple functions. He's going to worship Allah. He's going to go on a pilgrimage to Mecca. But he's going to be the assistant adjutant de camp of the Islamic Messiah, the Mahdi, also known as the 12th Imam. More about their Jesus to begin with. But remember, he didn't die on the cross. He didn't raise from the dead. He's not the son of God. He didn't found Christianity. And they like to separate him from his Jewish identity, at least in effect. Islam gets its doctrines from two places, the Sunnah or the Hadith and the Quran. This is what they say about him. Allah is going to send them back to earth. To be the assistant to the Mahdi. Now. That's what they believe about Jesus. Brian McLaren, the author of A Generous Orthodoxy and the chief guru of the Emergent Church, who the usual cast of characters brought into Britain some years ago, he first 
generated controversy by saying the church should declare a moratorium on debating homosexuality and same-sex marriage for five years. Don't even discuss it. And if we've not arrived at a conclusion, a consensus in five years, we should declare another moratorium on discussing it for five years until the church decides. How does the church decide that something God has already decided? Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. <laughs> As I like to put it. Well, he didn't wait the five years. He performed the same-sex marriage for his son to his son's husband. Then there was Tony Campolo. It's Friday, but Sunday is coming. Good communicator, bad theologian, and a bad man. He is a bad man. And his son is worse. Tony Campolo was the first major evangelical leader in the United States to begin compromising on homosexuality. He was called by the mother of a homosexual who committed suicide and began crying to him. And she began telling him how his son, her son was a nice boy, you know. And this persuaded him to rethink the issue. You know. Then he comes out with the red letter Bible. What a liar. The scripture says all scripture is inspired. Jesus told the apostles, the Holy Spirit will remind you what I've taught you, and then you will remind them. Tony Campola says, no, that's wrong. We're red-letter Christians. It's only the words of Jesus that are the basis of doctrine. We don't get our doctrine from the black letters, <laughs> only from the red letters. And Jesus never condemned homosexuality. Well, <laughs> I beg to differ from the book of Revelation, but even if he were right, we can only base our doctrine on the red letters, not the black ones, and there's no against homosexuality. There's nothing against bank robbery either. Can you go out and stick up Lloyd's? You know? <laughs> this is what he said. This is what he teaches. And there's people who believe that devil. And his son is worse than he is. That man is a devil. And then he comes out with what Muslims say about Jesus is a lot closer than what many Christians say about Jesus. That he's not God's son, that he was never crucified for our sin, he never died, he never rose from the dead. And he says, that's closer to what many Christians believe. Scampola. A son of Beelzebub, if there ever was one. A man is a son of Beelzebub. And his own son is worse. But let's go further. I mentioned the Mahdi. The Mahdi, the 12th Imam, he will establish the final caliphate. Now, the last caliphate was the Turkish one when the Ottoman Empire declined and Atatuka ended it in 1923 after World War I when Allenby defeated the Kirks in Jerusalem, ended the Ottoman Empire. They were aligned with the Kaiser, the Turks. 
the whole thing with Lawrence of Arabia and all of that. That was the end of the caliphate. But there will be another caliphate coming, at least one final one. This final caliphate will be established by the Mahdi. He will lead the last jihad, and he will be the savior, not just of Islam, but of the world. He will have an army that will carry black flags. That's why you see the Iranian army and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard with the black flags. And he'll go from nation to nation. First, he will go to Israel and kill all the Jews and set up his capital in Jerusalem and rule from the Temple Mount. After he's killed the Jews, he'll make peace. But it won't last. His plan is to make a peace with the Jews and the West. That's what it says. For seven years. Sound familiar? Yes. And he will come on a white horse. Just as the Antichrist comes on a white horse in Revelation 6, 1 and 2, counterfeiting Jesus in Revelation 19, Islam teaches he's going to come on a white horse. And if you can believe it, the Sunnah quotes from Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. It says that is the Mahdi. We know what's the Antichrist. He'll be a descendant of Mohammed, says the Sunnah, and he will establish a new world order. This is what they teach. Now, you have to understand something. The government of Jordan was established by the British. Most Jordanians are Palestinians. Maybe 25, 30% are Bedouins from the tribe of the Hashemites. Mohammed was a Hashemite. Yeah, Hashemite. It's interesting that the government of Jordan has a Hashemite government, even though it's demographically a Palestinian state. Don't let people tell you it's a two-state solution. There's always been one. It's called Jordan. King Hussein of Jordan himself, the father of the present king, Abdullah II, said that Jordan is Palestine in 1970. Yes, sir, Arafat? said Palestine is Jordan in 1968. They said it themselves. There's, all, there's always been a two-state solution. You hear about the Palestinian refugees, so-called, in Lebanon. They didn't come from Israel, most of them. They came from Jordan. They were driven out in black September of 1972 by the Hashemite government from the family of Mohammed, their prophet. Watch Jordan. Now, you notice something about Jordan. I met King Hussein when I was 15 years old in Virginia. I met him briefly, but I met him. Married an American. The Waf, the Islamic authority that controls the Temple Mount, Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Mosque of Omar, the Waf, is not controlled by the Palestinian Authority. Who's it controlled by? The government of Jordan. And everybody knows the Jordanian government has been on the CIA payroll <laughs> since the Six-Day War. 
And everybody knows King Abdullah and his father were educated in this country. He graduated Sandhurst. And that Her Majesty's government armed and equipped the Jordanian Legion that wiped out Arafat's people, killing between 15 and 18,000 of Arafat's fighters in black September of 1970. Trained and armed by the British. These Hashemites were educated here. They speak English as well as the king. So many of the government bureaucrats are, some of them studied in the States, the rest are Oxbridge. And all the military commanders are Sandhurst graduates, including the king himself. There is a reason that we are told in Daniel that areas of, we'll see this tomorrow more, Jordan, Amman, which is the capital of central Jordan, Edom and Moab will not be given into the hand of the Antichrist. Yes. It's interesting, isn't it? And it gets more interesting. They believe the Mahdi is going to be a Hashemite, a descendant of Muhammad. Notice something about Jordan. To the Arabs, they're Arab. To the British and Americans, to NATO, he's with us. He's with the West, but he's with the Islamic world. He's got a foot in both camps. A foot in both camps. This is very, very important in understanding the Antichrist. More about this tomorrow. But what else do they say about the Mahdi who will establish the new world order who will be the one on the white horse in the book of Revelation? They say that. That he will find hidden scriptures, not Islamic scriptures, Judeo-Christian scriptures. He'll find portions of the Torah that are lost and hidden gospels. Now understand something. The Muslims say a fifth century forgery of the gospel, uh, Mahmadi texts and things like this, wrong place, wrong season, wrong, wrong century. The Gnostic gospel of Thomas and things like this are the real gospel. Not Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. This has always been the Islamic game. The Christian gospels are corrupted. We have the right one, this fifth century thing. Which is a sodigraphal nonsense. Nonetheless, when the Mahdi comes, he's going to get, Muslims say, copies of the gospel that will go back they believe, to the time of Jesus. Copies of the Torah will go back to ancient Israel. And he's going to find them near the Sea of Galilee, of all places. Of all places. And these hidden scriptures will show Jews and Christians that they've been very wrong all along. He's going to be loved by everybody. When Jesus comes back, he's going to come back on a minaret on a mosque near Damascus, they say. And he's going to meet up with the jihad armies of the Mahdi. And he's going to come into his role. He is going to pray to the Mahdi. Jesus Christ will pray to the Mahdi. And he will assist the Mahdi. 
He will come to this minaret near Damascus as a radical Muslim being bought by two angels who will then team up with the Mahdi. And he will be the primary executioner of the Mahdi. He will be the greatest evangelist for Islam. He will correct Christians. That Christianity, as they've known it, is not true, but the Islamic version is true. And he will establish Sharia as global law. He will also be the final witness against all non-Muslims. He will be the prophet and the executioner of the Mahdi. And he will, this is their Christ, shatter crosses. Destroy Christianity. He'll also abolish the Jizra. When you see Muslims coming to Britain, claiming to be refugees and going on the dole, to them, that's the Jizra. That's demitude. That you're paying the penalty tax for not being a mob. That's how they see social benefit that you have to pay to support them. They're entitled to it because you're not a Muslim. You should. That's how they see it. That's that's why they want to come here instead of to Muslim countries to go on the dole to get their jizra. But because all non-Muslims will either be converted to Islam or be killed, he'll abolish the jizra. He'll also kill all pigs. And he will kill the Islamic Antichrist. When their Jesus returns, he will kill the Islamic Antichrist. The Islamic Antichrist. Now let's look at these things. They got Christ. Okay. Whoops. Not working too well. They've got the Madi. 12th Imam and then the Islamic Antichrist they have an antichrist too. He is called the Dajjal, sometimes Dajil. The Dajjal. He's going to come riding on a mule. Like, counterfeiting Jesus and the and he said he's going to have one eye I can't quite figure that bit out but. <laughs> but he will claim to be the son of God the Dajjal will claim to be the son of God And the army of Satan, who opposes the Mahdi, will be led by the Dajjal, the Muslim Antichrist. 
His end will come because Christ, their Christ, will kill him. Their Christ will kill the Islamic Antichrist. The goal will be global domination, ruled by not the Torah of the Jews, but by When that happens, that'll be their equivalent of the millennium, although they don't put it in thousand-year terms. That's the goal. Now, remember, their concept of heaven is not like ours. Okay. Sharia. This is shocking. Two weeks ago, the senior elder statesman of Hamas, who lives a five-star lifestyle in Qatar. He's not in Gaza himself. The functional administrative leader is a billionaire. Guess how he got the money? Stole the international aid given to the people of Gaza. The way Hamas got control of Gaza was Arafat's people, Fatah, looted the international aid from America, Europe, and Britain, given to help the Gaza people build an infrastructure as the embryo of a state. They stole the money. The people turned to Hamas. There was a civil war between Hamas and Fatah, Arafat's people. Backed by Iran, eventually Hamas won, but they killed 8,000 of each other. Of course, you didn't see people calling for a ceasefire or a truce. <laughs> the UN didn't seem to have much of a problem with it. Anyway, Hamas got power. Then they stole the money. Some stuff they stole for military purposes. Terrorist purposes, I should say. But the rest they just did what Fatah did. This guy's a billionaire living in Qatar in a five-star hotel. So you've got the elder statesman Mahmoud al-Zahar. Mahmoud Al Zahar This is what he said two weeks ago. This is not a fight for land what commenced on the 7th of October. It is not just about destroying the Zionists. It is not about Palestine. It is about all 510 million square kilometers of the Earth's surface and bringing Sharia. And then he went on to say, we'll not just kill the Zionists, we're going to kill all Jews. And this is the Hamas Charter. These people lying, oh, they're defending themselves from an occupation. One, there was no occupation. And two, they, they want to kill all Jews, not just Israelis. Because that is the teaching. 
of their theology. And then he said, when we kill the Jews, we will destroy the traitor Christians. They see Christians as traitors. Christ Christians to them are traitors to Islam. <laughs> they believe something false about Jesus, which disagrees with the Islamic teaching about Jesus. He said, it's not about Israel or Gaza or Palestine. It's about the whole world. It's not about killing the Zionists. It's about killing all Jews and all Christians, unless, of course, they convert to Islam. He openly said this. Yet you've got left-wing journalists, left-wing academics, politicians, defending Hamas and ignoring their self-stated agenda. The stupidity of these left-wing students and people like the stupidity is only eclipsed by their spiritual delusion. They openly state this. Now what is Mahmoud al-Zahar teaching? Islamic eschatology. Who were the sponsors of Hamas, of the Houthis, and of Hezbollah? Iran, the black flags. That's their eschatology. Now notice something. It is an exact convolution of what the Judeo-Christian scriptures teach. Our Christ, the Son of God, is their antichrist. Our Jesus is their antichrist. Their Mahdi is our antichrist. Who then is their Jesus? Their Jesus is what the book of Revelation calls the false prophet. What John the Baptist, Yohanan the Matbiya, was to Jesus, their Jesus is going to be to the Mahdi. Remember, look what it says in the book of Revelation chapter 13 about the function of the false prophet as we call him. Turn with me, please, briefly to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. Verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. Now the earth typologically is often associated with Israel, as opposed to the sea associated with the Gentile nations, particularly of the Mediterranean. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. It's interesting he has two horns. Catholic, Protestant, whatever, I don't know, but he has two horns. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell on it worship the first beast. Remember, the one they say is Christ is going to worship the Mahdi. Here, the false prophet fulfills a similar function for the beast. 
whose fatal wound was healed. Now remember, their Christ is going to kill the Dajjal. Their false prophet is going to kill our Jesus, they think. Only they don't think about it the way we do. And he does all these other things. What the Muslims say about Isa, Jesus, is what the book of Revelation says about the false prophet. What the Mahdi says about the Mahdi, about the 12th Imam, is what the book of Revelation says about the Antichrist. And, sorry, what, and what the, the, the Jal, their Antichrist, is what the book of Revelation says about Christ. It's the exact opposite, you understand. Now this goes all the way back to Genesis. No, it is Ishmael, not Isaac. No, it is Esau, not Jacob. It goes all the way back to Genesis. What you see in the book of Revelation is the culmination of what we see in, in Genesis, isn't it? The woman and the stars, the dragon and the serpent. The, you know, the, the serpent was a quadruped or a biped. It was a dragon, then it crawled. Okay. The blood crying out from the altar in Revelation, like the Abel's blood crying out, it's the same. Okay. The Bible, again, as we've said many times, is like a loaf of bread out of a baker's oven that has not been sliced yet. It looks the same on both ends, Genesis and Revelation. Well, with Islam, it's the same. Only it reverses what it says in Genesis. It is not Isaac, it's Ishmael. Not Jacob, Esau. Not the 12 sons of Jacob, it's the 12 princes of Edom, of Esau. It was the opposite of Genesis. It's the opposite of Revelation, you understand? It's a template. It's a carbon copy. Only everything is in reverse order. And it is growing. Not just in the Middle East. Now they can hijack a British national day of observance and memorial to the war dead. They can hijack it. They can take over the government of Scotland. They can take over the mayoralty of London. Not Dick Whittington anymore, it's Sahib. And then you've got devils pretending to be brothers in Christ like Campola and McLaren. McLaren actually taught, wrote in his book that there is a great hope that they have this belief in Jesus. It doesn't deal with the fact that it's not our Jesus, it's Jesus. Because he can save Christianity and other religions. The emergent church people teach that Islam can save Christianity? 
The salvation of Christianity is Islam? When I lived in London, I preached just about every Sunday in Speaker's Corner. After me, Jay Smith and these other guys came along. And I was always down there. One of the things you always see, this is what Islam will say, this is what the Muslims say. Every Sunday at Speaker's Corner, you'll find them saying this. Look at the homosexuality. Your bishops are homosexual, and the Church of England says you have to have same-sex marriages. Because Christianity is a failure. It's Islam that will morally save Britain. They say this. You understand? The Muslim activists, what's preached in the mosques in Britain is that Islam can save this Christian country. The hope the moral salvation of Britain is Islam. They teach that. And when they see that specimen of irreligious sewage known as the C of E, it convinces them they're right. It convinces them they're right. Our imams would never do that. Your bishops do it. They're convinced they're right. When you, the devil's got the Archbishop of Canterbury in his pocket, they don't take much convincing, do they? You understand what's happening is a judgment of God and a consequence of the backslidden state of the nation and its so-called church. Now, I'm not picking on Britain. Believe me, America, the Southern Baptists, I could be saying things just as debaucherous. But we happen to be in Britain. This is what's going on. When you look at what they believe, and when you look at what's happening in light of what they believe, and when you look at what's happening in light of the prophecies about Iran in Daniel 10 and certain other passages, including Gog and Magog, which we'll look at tomorrow, Lord willing, you can see why there are born-again evangelical Bible expositors who are persuaded that the Antichrist will be a Muslim. Are they right? Or are they wrong? We cannot ignore that question. In light of reality, we cannot ignore that question. It demands an answer, and it demands a biblical answer. It demands an answer. We cannot just dismiss them. We cannot just throw their arguments out the window and say that stuff's crazy. We cannot behave like the pre-trib people do. Ignorance is not blitz. Ignorance is self-destructive. The question has to be addressed. And on the basis of God's word, the question has to be answered. I will resume here tomorrow. Now let me say this, I'm no praiser of men, I'm a praiser of God, but I thank God for the men he uses. While I didn't always agree with him, I usually agreed with him 90% of the time, if not 95% of the time, I agreed with David Pawson. We were friends, we didn't always agree, but we usually did. And most of the disagreements were friendly, most. I used to tell my friend David Pawson, I remember being down at his house in, near Basingstoke. Uh, that he was the last of the Mohegans. You know that American term? Yes. That of the dynasty of great British Bible expositors, my apologies if you heard me say this, going back to, to Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon and and, and, and certainly Martin Lloyd-Jones and, and, and Campbell P P Morgan, G. Campbell Morgan and these people. 
that he was the last of that dynasty. There's no British expositor of the caliber of those men now. And, of course, we know from the Old Testament, when God removes godly leadership, that's, that's a judgment in itself. I prayed that God would raise up more British people. Now, don't get me wrong. My family were from here. I love Britain. I've never desired anything but a move of God in Britain. I think if you know me at all, you'd know that. I've always loved Britain since I was a kid, my grandmothers and so on, always. I'm an Anglophile. I guess I'm technically Anglo-American. But, and my daughter's a British citizen, my grandson's a pretty, you know, Anglo-American. But it became harder and harder to find British preachers. I'm not saying they don't exist, but they're few and far between. And I don't say this to praise any man. I'm just praising God that he answered the prayers of myself and others, that the Lord would begin raising up some British people. Yeah. Tomorrow you'll be hearing from a young man I believe God is raising up in this country. Not somebody with a New York accent. <laughs> not, 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 not somebody who's Israeli and a Yank and all of that stuff. I mean a proper Brit. I heard Tim preach a message not long ago at a church affiliated to Moriel near his church, not too far from here. And it was one of the best teachings I'd ever heard. And I knew it was right to ask him to come to the Moriel conference and to deliver that message. And he'll be doing that tomorrow. So tomorrow I will continue, but we will be hearing, first of all, from Pastor Tim Leach tomorrow. Have a very good evening.